Hello, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. My name is uh, Martin Loffers. I'm the chief trend watcher of uh, Supply Chain Media. You might also know me as uh, the editor-in-chief of Supply Chain Movement. So I will be uh, the moderator of this uh, interactive, interactive uh, and live webinar. We'll, uh, we'll uh, going to talk about a, a very interesting and a hot topic uh, about uh, well, freight uh, uh, rates uh, around the globe in supply chain. And with me, I have uh, uh, three experts. So I'll, I will introduce you to them uh, right now. So on the left, you see my, myself, uh, probably know my picture. So, um, and next to me, I have uh, Oliver uh, Richmond. Um, he is uh, the co-founder of uh, Shipstar. Hi, Oliver. Hey, hey, Martin. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, and next, uh, we have also dear Carson Harris. Uh, he's purchasing manager, global category manager of ocean freight at uh, Continental. And at the, the fourth uh, expert is Sasha Gaze. Uh, he's corporate purchasing in a, in the matter of logistics at class. Uh, okay, Sasha, hi. Hi, hello, everybody. All right. Uh, some some uh, you know household rules. Uh, so this is a live webinar. It will be recorded, and afterwards we will make uh, the presentation available uh, with all the interesting slides. So the audience is on mute, but um, feel free to uh, ask questions. And there are several ways to ask questions. You have the chat function. Everybody can uh, see uh, the chat function on the right hand side. Uh, but you know um, it would be better. To use uh, the Q and A functionality, because uh, people can even vote on the questions, so uh, to prioritize them. Um, and I can imagine there are a lot of uh, questions about freight rates and about uh, trade lanes and that kind of stuff. Um, I will, you know, um, try to uh, uh, ask this question to the experts during uh, the webinar. Is it if it's in line of the discussion? If not, I will reserve them for our Q and A at the end. Uh, so we have a QA and a at the end, but if your questions are not being answered, uh, there are also a 30 minutes afterwards, so after 5 o'clock CET, we have 30 minutes, we go into the lounge, so the experts will be available over there, and you can uh, ask the questions to uh, the experts uh, in the lounge, so, so that will be made available. Um, and so you can also enlarge your screen, you see the small arrows in the upper right corner of uh, the screen of the slides, so you can enlarge your uh, your uh, slides to uh, to read them. Um, and as I said, um, we have uh, the lounge afterwards. So if you have more questions, if you want to connect to uh, either Shipster class or Continental or me, you can uh, sit down at a table and talk to us uh, afterwards after five o'clock. All right. So these are things uh, I have to say, and let's start. So, um, what is this uh, webinar all about? We're going to talk about, uh, uh, well, uh, freight to an extent. So, I'll uh, introduce Shipsta, uh, the co-host of this webinar. We talk about the market development, uh, you know, in this turbulent market and the outlook. And then we move over to some 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 customers of Shipsta who are, uh, you know, have have managed uh, their freight uh, uh, to a large extent. We talk about uh, multi-tendering. Um, and also, we, we, we end up, how can we you know, improve our uh, procurement of freight uh, globally? And then we have a Q&A at the end, as I mentioned. So first, um, I would like to introduce Shipsta. So um, Oliver, could you explain something, uh, who Shipsta is and what your company is? Hey, Martin, thanks for the introduction. Um, and hello again to everyone. I've seen that uh, some uh, of our customers are also in the audience, so uh, welcome. Um, Shipstar is a, a technology a company um, with a focus on smart logistics procurement solution. That's basically our core com competence. Um, our mission is to make um, logistics procurement more efficient and uh, also uh, autonomous so that's uh, our clear objective um, we have a team of uh, more than 60 experts we just moved uh, to the shipster tower uh, at our head office uh, in uh, luxembourg and in addition to uh, luxembourg we also have uh, an office in the lovely port town of uh, hamburg and uh, you're also mentioned on our um, uh, maturity matrix of uh, European uh, supply chain uh, startups and scale-ups, and you are uh, mentioned there in uh, uh, the category of uh, uh, freight uh, as a, as a scale-up. 
Um, yeah, we have been accelerating uh, a lot. You know, we uh, within 12 to 18 months, uh, we moved, uh, I think, from about 20 employees to uh, now 65. So um, we are really on the on the road of success right now. Yeah, and then also well funded. That's also good to know. Um, can you tell me about your platform? Uh, you know, you have a large offering, but can you explain a bit more? Yeah, we we are offering an all-in-one platform to cover basically all uh, needs along the um, procurement process. So everything starts basically with the rate management, getting your rates into the system to establish a baseline, get uh, instant visibility on your business and um, rate developments on the dashboard. Um, we um, push more and more the subject of business intelligence by now having integrated uh, the biggest um, or largest source of uh, market data. Um, and we will also um, develop new um, um, auto procure functionality to um, um, yeah, automate procurement uh, um, um, processes. We are now moving into the space of um, carbon footprint. So we have uh, just recently launched a product um, of Shipstar Planet. So you can basically um measure monitor and uh, improve your co2 emissions in order to uh, meet uh, global objectives uh, to become co2 um, uh, neutral or even uh, negative and uh, we have uh, really really unique uh, tools on our platform to ease uh, spot and uh, contract buying um, analytics uh, but also for the operational departments we have a really cool freight calculator to quickly um, calculate uh, freight costs Okay. Yeah, uh, but this is all uh, based on ocean freight. To, to be clear, no, uh, actually we cover all mode of transport. Good remark, uh, Martin. So it's uh, air, ocean, road, okay. um, yeah. rail. You basically can uh, handle all kind of mode of transport or products through our platform. Yeah, so we'll talk about a lot about ocean freight because there are a lot of. Uh, uh, strange uh, things happening in that area, but uh, it's good to know that you have uh, uh, all the other um, uh, modalities. Um, let's talk about market development. So here's an interesting quote. So what do you see in the market, Oliver? Yeah, and uh, this is uh, really a true uh, statement because none of us uh, has ever seen the market skyrocketing uh, like this. Um, this situation has caused uh, significant delays uh, on the supply chains. Here, um, Dirk and uh, Sasha from Continental and Classic can confirm that. And uh, some companies even uh, did run out of uh, stock, um, stopped their production. We are looking at uh, the automotive companies, for instance. So they have, have had entire shutdowns. So shippers are fighting for capacity to get their cargo shipped um, for production or to bring uh, the products into the stores yeah. and um, I like to talk uh, about what has caused the boom in container shipping uh, because it's not uh, clear to uh, everyone um, how uh, did the freight rates develop uh, and uh, more important what is the outlook and uh, how can you use this uh, information from the webinar uh, for your procurement strategy um, so because uh, tender season is coming up for ocean freight, so uh, now it's basically last minute to uh, redefine your procurement strategy. So um, if you look, look at the prices uh, of China uh, shipping, so uh, can you uh, comment uh, briefly on this? Yeah, uh, we can really say freight rates on the spot market exploded. Um, so what it cost uh, $1,500 to $2,000 for a 40-foot container, uh, in the past uh, is now um, around 13,000 or even um, higher to secure um, capacity on the spot market. And uh, I think we all have heard those horror stories <laughs> that shipper did pay $20,000 to get the freight moved. Um, but this actually happened. You know, those are true stories. And um, if you look at the charts here, the price impact on the European market is the highest. Yeah. But uh, of course, uh, also the um, the rates are sky high um, on the other markets uh, like the US Atlantic or US Pacific. So, so why is uh, uh, the boom in the rates uh, to, to, to Europe the highest? Um, that's, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
Um, we can uh, look at it uh, later on when we uh, proceed with the slides, uh, what, what's happening and what the reason is. Yeah, okay. So what do you see here? Um, so this is uh, from, from, from October now to, uh, to July. Yeah, if if you have a closer look and uh, look at uh, at the different uh, rate levels, Martin, um, mm -hmm. we see um, we just selected the trade uh, Asia main to uh, North uh, Europe main, mm -hmm. um, and we see that uh, a shipper pays an average seven times more what they have used to pay um, on the spot market. Um, on the contract market, uh, we see also an increase of two hundred fifty uh, percent. Um, for a lot of shippers, it's really difficult to ship uh, any more on contract rates. Um, and that's currently the biggest operational challenge. Um, they're just pushed uh, to sh short-term uh, uh, rate levels. Um, mm -hmm. And Im important to mention is also um, that not every shipper is paying the same uh, freight. And uh, you can see the T also clearly on the chart. It's basically split by uh, different market levels, you know, going from uh, low, um, mid low average, uh, mid high to high, because it strongly depends uh, on your negotiation power, volumes, industry, the location you are um, um, at. And of course, requirements like uh, do you uh, want to have space protection uh, and so on. So um these and also many more factors uh, will uh, determine if you're basically on a low high or even uh, average uh, uh, rate level yeah so so this is actually the similar situation like when you are flying on an airplane you don't know uh, what the, the the person next to you has been paying but probably uh, not the same amount uh, hopefully higher than than yourself but now this is uh, in a similar, similar situation in the uh, container market yeah, if you're a frequent flyer and uh, if you <laughs> uh, if you have enough bonus miles, then of course uh, the likeliness uh, that uh, you you will be able to obtain uh, more competitive rates are higher than your if you're more uh, sporadic uh, um, shipper, if you're maybe an Amazon seller, and uh, if you don't have uh, big volumes um, um, to offer. Yeah. So how does the overall market look like? Yeah, um, and this is a good question. Um, we have been looking at the uh, export from Asia, but um, is this uh, really a, a situation which um, represents a global market? Um, so we have uh, selected some of the biggest trades here, and we can definitely say um, all markets are heavily affected. Um, but if you uh, have a closer look here at um, especially Northern Europe uh, uh, and US coast to um, Far East Maine, we see that there's already a slight relief, you know, in pricing. So here in this um, uh, data from last week, we show uh, minus 8% and mi minus 1%. So we see that in certain uh, areas or trade lanes, rates are cooling off a bit, but we cannot talk about a trend yet because uh, peak season is ahead of us. And always remember, we are coming from a very high level. You know, even if you're talking about a reduction, it's a reduction from a really high pricing level. Yeah, yeah that's good, good to mention, yeah. Um, and if you look at uh, the global container demand, so what is the, the, that uh, index doing? Yeah, uh, this is uh, also very interesting. So what has uh, really caused the high uh, container prices? Because uh, if you look uh, at the statistics, um, um, the market, uh, the, the global demand did only go up by 5% compared to 2019. Of course, this is an average across everything globally. But um, during lockdowns, uh, maybe you know it uh, from yourself, consumption uh, or consumers have changed their consumption behavior significantly. You know, um, there was a real e-commerce boom and um, because people didn't know where to spend any money, you know, um, instead of uh, travel services and so on, uh, they bought outdoor gears, garden and home improvement uh, stuff. Um, so and those products typically come from China or some other Asian areas. Um, so that means the import volumes uh, from Asia uh, in all the markets, if it's US or, or Europe, but even in US stronger, the consumers did really go bananas. Uh, uh, they did re consume much, much more. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, but volumes uh, did increase really, really significantly. Um, if you look at the US ports, for instance, um, imports from China um, through the biggest um, um, import um, uh, ports, Long Beach and Lo Los Angeles, they've increased by 40%. And this is really a big challenge also for the uh, hinterland infrastructure. Yeah, I heard uh, last week there were 24 container ships uh, waiting uh, outside the port uh, to be handled and uh, unloaded. So uh, 24 container ships couldn't even go into the port. So that, that's major. So there's a really uh, a traffic jam uh, over there at Long Beach. Yeah, and we see it also in China and other areas. And that's also partly a reason for blank sailings because, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, shipping lines don't have any other choice to skip uh, port call. Yeah. Um, so what are the main causes of uh, all these uh, bottlenecks and high rates? Yeah, what is uh, the reason? Um, congestion is really the cause of the problem. But uh, what is causing congestion? Mm -hmm. There are many reasons for us. Um, I just mentioned the high consumption, you know, uh, did lead to higher import volumes. But yep. uh, this had an impact on the hinterland infrastructure. So uh, backlogs were built up since the infrastructure could not handle all the volumes. The result is a shortage of containers, because if you don't get the containers uh, delivered to the final destination, you will not be able to return them uh, back to uh, where they are needed. So um, that's also the reason mainly in US why uh, shipping lines refuse to take export cargo um, to improve the turnaround times to get container ships uh, as quickly as possible back to Asia. Um, in addition, we had a series of unexpected events, you know, uh, we have seen it all on the news and you see it here on the background, um, uh, the Suez Canal blockage um, yeah. I ever given. Yeah. By the way, that's the same ship which uh, did uh, um, uh, have a collision uh, in Hamburg with a, um, with a little ferry in 2019, so uh, it was uh, really interesting. Um, <laughs> Port closures due to COVID, just to name a few, Ningbo and Yantian, uh, one of the largest export ports uh, um, of South China. And in Ningbo, for instance, the capacity dropped by 70% from 200 to 60 ships per week. Um, capacity is now back, but it takes some time to work through the backlog, you know, um, if you take out so much capacity. Also in recent years, um, a lot of ships have been uh, scrapped because uh, the freight, <coughs> sorry, the freight rates were so low that from an economical point of view, it didn't make any sense to operate the ships anymore. So capacity is missing. Shipping lines um, are trying now to charter any kind of ship to get things moving. And even dry cargo ships are uh, loading in some seldom cases uh, containers. And this really shows how crazy the market is right now. And there are also some uh, commenters that are saying, you know, you know, uh, uh, the carriers have taken out uh, capacity deliberately to, uh, to, you know, to raise the, 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 the freight rates. So uh, that's yeah. also a comment. That's um, also something what I uh, um, uh, see. Um, we will touch that on the carrier slide. Yeah. So, 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 you know. What does it all mean for the carriers? So what is about how the, is the profitability of carriers and freight forwarders are developing? Yeah, shipping lanes, lines uh, make more money than ever uh, made. And um, so you see here uh, clearly the um, trend lines um, uh, of rates for the long-term market, meaning contract rates uh, from Europe um, and uh, US to, to Asia. And uh, we see in green, basically, uh, the profit, the EBIT margin of um, container carriers in gray of uh, freight forwarders. And we see in Q2 of 2020, uh, the shipping lines still optimize themselves because um, uh, freight rates were going down, but uh, margins uh, went up. So they already improved uh, their processes in turn and other stuff in order to get profitability up. But then basically, rates were climbing up and uh, the freight forwarders, of course, are participating, um, but not as much as the shipping lines, you know. The mm -hmm. freight forwarders, um, they uh, basically doubled uh, the EBIT margin. But if you charge big, you know, uh, the earning, of course, it's much easier to earn more. 
But the shipping lines, if you look uh, around 30%, then uh, yeah, they're basically printing money in this current market situation. Yeah, but, um, other, yeah, but on the other hand, I also uh, hear complaints from uh, uh, big multinationals, uh, uh, you know, household names, uh, uh, shipping s stuff from China to, to Europe or to US that, you know, uh, the lead times uh, aren't made. So, you know, uh, we see all, all kinds of delays. So these major multinationals are forcing Maersk and others uh, to have alternatives. And so now uh, Maersk is also putting in the uh, uh trains cargo trains from china to europe so uh, if you look at uh, the train the cargo train capacity or the cargo train uh usage has been tripled or almost fivefold uh so you see other trends also related to this and it's, it's not only on our ocean freight but also it's uh, uh you know creating uh traffic jams of trains in kazakhstan and, and uh, elsewhere in uh, russia from uh, from china to to, to europe so uh, yeah, this is yeah, right yeah. also alternative uh, routes um or modes are totally um congested um yeah. but uh you just mentioned uh rail transportation but we are always talking about um the asian market because this is the market with the biggest um, price increases but um a lot of uh, shippers, uh, they don't have volumes on those lanes they have other volumes but they are also affected by price increases but they don't have uh, those alternatives. You know, they cannot go on the Silk Road. Um, you can go by rail, of course, from uh, Southern uh, Europe to Northern Europe, but basically that's it, right? Yeah. Uh, and you can also charter a truck from China uh, to uh, Europe, but you pay also $20,000 uh, for that. And you have also risks uh, associated to that with um, border crossings, custom clearances, uh, and so on. Yeah. So um, the question is, um, uh, are these three alternatives, you know, uh, to get your supply chain going? And um, even if you look at uh, planes, investments in cargo planes have gone up and ride rates are also high at 20 to $30, you know, um, per kilogram ex Shanghai. So that brings us to uh, the next slide, Martin, um, that the carriers are still in a really, really strong position because there are not a lot of alternatives um, available. And um, so if you look at the capacity of the top five container carriers um, based on the um, market share, mm -hmm. uh, 96, you know, it was 27%. Now that 65% market share of the top five container carriers. And this is also what you mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a consolidation in the container shipping industry, uh, we look at USC, at um, um, Hamburg Süd, uh, Hanjin, uh, you know, and so on. So there's a clear consolidation what makes the shipping line stronger. And the alliances are also uh, getting stronger. We have slot charter agreements. Um, so the biggest carriers are basically on one alliance, the 2M. Um, and what you've mentioned is also what I uh, see basically that by purpose also um, shipping lines uh, have accelerated the trend uh, to reduce uh, capacity to create shortages. So, I got, yeah, I got a question from the audience uh, and maybe we get to the market outlook uh, ahead. But um, when do you expect the backlog is being processed? Yeah, uh, I will get to that in a, in a second, actually. Um, so, but uh, the reduced capacity is also, of course, um, vessels have been ordered, but it takes more than 18 months to build a vessel, you know? So, um, and this partly uh, answers the question, if you look at the next slide um, of the outlook. Um, um, of course, we don't have a crystal ball, um, but if you look uh, at some facts, you know, uh, port congestion continues um, uh, because there's a backlog uh, which need to be cleared. Uh, then we have uh, still the uncertainty that it may happen again, you know, that uh, China may close uh, ports again for a couple of days or even weeks, you know. Um, so the U.S. Con consumer demand is still really, really high, but it may decrease, you know. At one point, uh, people have everything in their households, right? So, <laughs> And uh, they're also spending their money now uh, again on services, you know 
restaurants, uh, movies, um, travel, for instance. Um, but there's still a lack of, lack of containers. Um, and uh, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, container vessels are not delivered anytime soon, any new buildings. Um, early 23, 24. And uh, we are moving now into a peak season, you know, uh, because end of year is always peak season. And um, we are also moving then quickly to beginning of the year we have, uh, where we have uh, Chinese New Year. So uh, my personal opinion is there will be a relief, but um, I think the next few months will be still really, really critical. Um, so I think um, the global market itself will uh, remain on a high level, but market will calm down uh, at one point because we are really, really sky high. So it will go down uh, at, at one point. And uh, if you look um, at the right side of the chart, so we have access to um, market data. And if you look at the um, rates which um, shipper have contracted within the past three months, uh, we get an outlook um, of the rate level for the next uh, nine months. Of course, this may change month by month, you know. Um, because we are moving now into the uh, tender season, into the procurement season for ocean freight. But it gives you already an indication, basically a corridor uh, where you may end up if you procure today. You know? Yeah. So, so and, getting back to this question, when will the spot market will level out? Um, I, I personally believe that uh, the spot market uh, may level out um, uh, soon. Uh, typically, by the way, the contract market follows the spot market. So if you see uh, in three consecutive um, 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 areas, basically, that the market goes up or down, we receive already an indication, you know, if there will be some kind of a trend, um, okay. which has an impact on, on contract rates. But, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. So let, let's move over to the procurement challenges now and uh, and what to do. Yeah, okay, I uh, don't have to mention all the challenges, capacity, uh, long-term commitments, um, and even some uh, carriers and freight forwarders are refusing to quote because they're just uh, too busy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's basically the reason why we need to change the way we procure ocean freight. And uh, that's the purpose of the webinar, to give you some in inspiration, um, what to change basically or how to adjust your procurement uh, strategy. So basically, we're going to talk about uh, multi-tender strategies. So can you explain what these uh, strategies are? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, first is uh, you could basically um, um, increase your tender frequency. So uh, shorten rate validities um, and run more tenders. Um, um, uh, purpose is basically, uh, since the rates are on such a high level, you will not be um, losing money if the market goes down. Um, also, uh, index-based buying or pricing is basically a mechanism um, we will also touch later. But uh, you uh, clearly need to um, review where to uh, apply indices, you know, and which markets. But uh, this is also a good mechanism to say, okay, I don't want to um, come to uh, any long-term commitments. Let's review that month by month. And, uh, you know, we will synchronize basically the rate levels with the market. And um, then we have uh, something what we uh, cover under business segmentation. Uh, this could be basically that you say, okay, I have ABC lanes, you know, um, or um, I have basically markets which are relatively calm, you know, for instance, uh, import markets from um, uh, Asia to Europe, um, where I say, okay, or uh, US uh, trade lanes, where I say, okay, I'm disconnecting those lanes uh, from my Asian volumes and splitting basically tenders. Instead of one global tender, I'm going to run multiple um, regional tenders, for instance. Okay. Yeah, we will talk about this uh, with the, the, the next uh, expert from my class in the Continental. Yeah. So, one, one last thing is yep. um, just uh, as a side comment, it's really important also, uh, not only the strategy itself, but also to reduce complexity. Because if uh, the tender frequency um, is increased, you know, mm -hmm. uh, suppliers like carriers and freight forwarders will receive more tenders. So they need to uh, supply more uh, manpower. 
So the less complexity a tender has, you know, the better chances you have to obtain a good and competitive pricing as well. Yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, let's move to uh, to uh, Sasha uh, Sasha Geese from uh, from uh, from Class. Class is a, a manufacturer of agricultural machines, but he will explain it himself. So, uh, Sasha, could you explain something about your company, the group? Yeah, for sure. Um, as you already mentioned, we are producing machines for the ag agriculture business. Uh, it's a family-owned uh, company, but we are more than 100 years old now, so founded in uh, 1913. Um, and as it mentioned in the slides, Katharina Klaas Mühlhäuser is uh, the shareholder of the committee and the supervisory board. And in the last year, it was uh, in 2020, we made a turnover of uh, 4 billion, the first time that we hit the 4, 4 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, and we made a pr um, profit from before taxes from nearly 160 million. And uh, I think this is quite interesting. More than 80% of our business is done without Germany. And uh, I'm doing the job with uh, 11,400 colleagues around the world. Um, but we are still located in, in Germany, in the um, big town in Hasewinkel. Uh, it's next to Bielefeld, so in the western part of Germany. Okay. So about the production sites, so where are your production sites uh, located? Yeah, this is a basement of our production site, but it's also implemented with our sales activities. So mm -hmm. it's uh, the countries which are marked in the dark green um, color. These are our main countries where we are producing or we are, where we are selling a, a huge number of machines and uh, products. And as you can see, the main uh, field is still Europe with many colors which are marked. And especially in the northern part of uh, America, southern part of America, Russia and India, China, our core markets. And uh, yeah, in Africa, I think our machines are in the most cases too expensive and not really interesting for the market. And uh, so we are busy in this area. Um, our production sites are located mainly in Germany and in France, so based on the history. But we have also a production site in the United States, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. We have a um, combine um, plant in, in Russia, in uh, Krasnodar, in the southern part of uh, Russia. And we have uh, different plants in India and in China, and we have a joint venture in Uzbekistan. So these are uh, your products? Yes, uh, we are producing the combine harvester. It was also the first machine we are produced um, on in different plants in uh, America, Europe, India, China, in different dimensions. Uh, the forage harvester, I think it's, uh, we are the world leader in the forage harvester business, and uh, we are proud of it because it's the only world leadership we have. And since uh, around 15 years, we are also producing tractors. This um, production site is located in Le Mans in France, and uh, also balers produced in France. And uh, we have a collaboration with Liebherr, who is producing the telescopic loader and wheel loader in Austria uh, for class. And yeah, for sure, we have a bit uh, big uh, service and parts business because this is uh, one main effect uh, of class that we have a big support uh, for the services, that we have a fast reaction if there's anything happening on the fields and we have to be fast. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, your role uh, in uh, corporate purchasing. Yeah, um, I'm the head of uh, logistics in the corporate purchasing. So uh, all my team is responsible to purchase uh, logistics services. In one case, it's freight, but also uh, contract logistics and container management. And even on the road side, um, we have uh, um, different types of transports like curtain cider, but also special equipment for low bits and plateau transports for our machines itself. Uh, and uh, for the sea transports, uh, Oliver talked about, we have for sure container shipments around the world, but uh, we have also raw, raw shipments, so roll off, roll, on, uh, roll, roll, off, roll on um, for our missions, um, especially the combine harvester, forage harvest and tractors are not uh, the best size to get in the container. And uh, what is different in this business is we are, uh, for the container shipment, we have an agreement with freight forwarder and they are kind of talking with the carrier itself. And for the Roho business, we are in direct contact with the carrier. Um, and on the other hand, we are also buying uh, Korea, Korea and Express transports. Uh, we have rail transports, uh, especially for the machine shipments. For sure, we need air, uh, air freight, which is not really lovely, but we have to need it. 
and uh, we have more and more contract logistics next to our plants and uh, which is based or which is one um, main task for us is that we have a big seasonality at class um, for example in Hasewinkel we are producing uh, in the uh, last quarter of the year so from October with November on, on a, a um, low number um, seven hours a day five days a week and in the first half of a calendar year from uh, the beginning of the year until June, July, we are producing five to six days a week and uh, until nine or 10 hours a day. So the main focus is the first uh, business uh, in the first year of the business year. And uh, that's why we have a big seasonality, which is quite a, a huge um, dynamic uh, effort to our um, sales, uh, to our provider. And uh, this is also faced in our business. And as you can see on the on the right side, the share of the spend I mentioned, this is based on our last business here in 2020. This was from October 19 to September 20. So there's no real impact on the sea transport or sea business. I think now we are more than 15 percent based on the uh, increased figures. All right. So, so you hear a lot about uh, production shutting down in automotive. Um, and you are not in automotive, but in, in a similar kind of market. Did you have any any shutdowns because of lack of uh, parts uh, and a bit like lack of uh, transport? Uh, yeah, we had uh, for sure uh, complexity in the last two years, uh, and especially in the beginning of 2020, we had also shutdowns of our factories in Europe. But this was mainly based on the Corona measurements we have to make or mm -hmm. we wanted to make. Um, but during this year. Yeah, for sure, we have to fight for each part and we have to take care about our trade lanes and our logistics transportations. But uh, nevertheless, the most of the uh, machines are produced in time. Uh, in some cases, we have to rework the machines, but we have never closed uh, um, a plan for, for a couple of days um, based on missing parts. It doesn't matter if the supplier was not able to deliver it or our uh, logistics uh, partner were not able to deliver in time. It's uh, good to hear. Great. Um, let's talk about uh, the, the ocean freight uh, in, in your business. Yeah, on, on this page, uh, you can see, you can click one more time for, for the arrows. Um, yeah, some uh, delivered or shown our, our main trade lanes. Uh, so in total, we have um, a roughly volume of 10,000 TUs per year. I think this is not the, the, the biggest one in the world, but it's uh, nevertheless not, uh, not uh, too less. And our main routes are between Europe and North America. This is based on our locations in uh, Germany and in, in Hungary to deliver our plant in North America and also to, to make the shipments uh, back. Uh, we have um, main routes from India and, and China, which is based on our sourcing um, strategy that we are also getting parts uh, out of this country. And we have uh, to deliver parts from Europe, especially from uh, Germany and France to Russia where our Russian uh, plant is located, yeah. yeah and this is uh, to get a little bit deeper in our, uh, let's call it uh, Atlantic tender. This is um, our sea transports, only container transports. For sure, we have also Roro shipments, but in this case, it's only container mentioned. Uh, 4,000 TUs per year, roughly. And in the westbound shipments, I already mentioned it, it's from the glass plant and uh, supplier in Europe to our plant in, in Omaha. And uh, from our plant in the southern of Germany, from Bad Salgo, we are uh, delivering um, produced machines which uh, fit in a container and uh, shipping it to um, North America, Canada, US, and Mexico. Um, and on the way back, we are supplying, uh, we're getting parts from supplier uh, from North America. And for sure, we have to send the empty bins and racks back. Uh, in the past, uh, what is the past uh, until beginning of 2020? Uh, we made a single source per trade and we are dividing the trade all shipments from Europe um, to Omaha and um, all the shipments from Batsalgo, so the produced machines to North America. It's more or less our um, two packages. And normally we uh, try to get a contract term for 12 months, so for one year. And we did normally two rounds. It could okay. be that we made a, a, a third round, but normally we did it in two. And if you compare this to China? Yeah, in China, we did it in the past in the same way. So we did our last um, uh, 
tender in uh, in the middle of 2020 and we made a contract for the second half which was a quite good time for us because the prices were fixed for the second half <laughs> and afterwards uh, oliver mentioned it, the prices increased and increased and uh, our prices were fixed so we were quite lucky but um, afterwards we, we changed our strategy because it was not able to get the container out of uh, china and it was not sensible to make a tender in this way so we were uh, we fixed the prices um, based on uh, the SCFI, so the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index. It was, from my point of view, the only possibility to have a fair market prices for class and also for the forwarder. And uh, for sure, the biggest topic is to get the container out of China. And uh, for sure, the price is important, especially in the, in the purchasing department, the price is important. But uh, at the end, we have to produce emissions, and that's why we have to accept this additional costs. So, so if you talk about uh, to wrap it up, your side, uh, the challenges uh, right now and the use of ship stock. Can you mention mention something about the challenges and the use of ship stock? Yes, yeah. As I already mentioned, yeah, our harvest season, we have to hit the harvest season, and uh, yeah, we have a strong focus, especially on the prices, but on reliability and on lead time. Because if we are not, if we have not to produce the machines ready for the harvest season, the season is over, and we cannot shift it as an automotive company to for four or six weeks. It's too late, and too late is too late. Um, yeah, and what did we do? Uh, we adjusted our processes, so we didn't store at uh, um, our supplier side. We made a normal transport to the harbor and made the container stowing in the harbor itself. Uh, we changed our lanes, we changed our mode, how to transport. For example, we have uh, a cutter bars, big attachments for the combine harvester, which we um, normally send uh, by container to the US market. And afterwards, we sent it raw, raw because we got a, a good rate and we got the capacity. So we try to increase our allocation uh, based on the forwarder and the forwarder to the carrier to have uh, fixed rates, especially from, from China. So uh, the allocation is more or less fixed to the SCFI and we, are not we have not to find a good price on the spot market. I think this is also quite important and to have fixed partner. Um, and for sure, we have an intensive uh, communication with all parties um, at the forwarder side and also at the class department. So we are not the only uh, department who is uh, speaking, talking with our forwarder. It's also uh, our product companies, our sourcing teams in India and China are connected in these uh, discussions. We are trying to give uh, a good forecast, as good as this is possible, and we make an early booking at least. Uh, four to six weeks before the vessel will uh, leave the harbor. And uh, yeah, I think this, these are the main topics we did in the past. Um, and yeah, while we are using Shipstar, this was your question at the beginning of, of yeah. this page. Uh, um, as Oliver mentioned, we have to uh, make more uh, tender. So in the past, we did it uh, uh, for, um, once a year. And for the Atlantic tender, we are doing it four times a year. So we have now only an agreement for three months. And that means we have more tasks to do, more labor which is needed for this because we have also to be sure for, for the land road transports, for the air transports and for the courier transports. And I, for us, this is a good uh, solution to have, um, uh, we, can, we can enter our demands, we can enter our um, um, price sheets and we can invite um, the forwarder once, two, three times a year with less effort. I think this is a, a really big effort, um, challenge for us, or was a big challenge for us. And the second topic is, we are also talking about routes we never bought for class. Mm -hmm. For example, the Pacific routes. So we have no shipments across the Pacific, but uh, our colleagues from the PRM, so um, buying the parts for class, ask us to support about the price development because it was also a task they got from their suppliers so they have to increase the price based on logistic costs and we supported them uh, with an increase or with the market prices at the moment and with the development of the market and this was also quite easy to do with uh, shipstar and um, yeah I, I hope we can compensate um, our needed capacity with shipstar and uh, we are also in contact with, with Oliver and his team to talk about the BIs, uh, new figures, about the development of the market. And I think the transparency is more important um, during the last months and weeks. 
Uh, Sasha, th thank you for your explanation. Uh, before we move over to uh, to Continental, um, first, uh, you, uh, Sasha mentioned uh, index-based pricing. Um, Oliver, could you uh, briefly explain what index-based pricing is? We are running a bit out of time, but uh, please yeah. can you explain okay. a bit. We'll try to do it very quickly. Um, so first of all, the question is, why would you do index-based pricing? And uh, Sasha also mentioned that uh, the market is so volatile um, so uh, you're looking for a mechanism, basically, to um, connect it to the market. Um, uh, advantage is you avoid frequent price and contract negotiations. And typically, basically, this is aiming um, for uh, long-term uh, partnerships uh, with your uh, suppliers. Um, it's also transparent for both parties. And uh, a shipper... Um, <clears throat> Sasha, you can confirm that uh, you, you can leverage your risks in volatile markets, uh, but uh, for the supplier, meaning freight forwarder or carrier, you can certainly protect your margins because uh, you have lower risks if basically the mechanisms are connected uh, to, to the market development. So at the end, so you can better manage your risk and profitability. And, um, and, and, and what should you do? So why, uh, why uh, are companies still failing? in this area yeah and uh, that's uh, really good because uh, it, it uh, sometimes it looks really uh, appealing but index-based pricing may not uh, always be the right answer for everything or everybody so um, at the outset it may appear to be a simple transparent solution but it becomes with its own set of challenges and executional complexities if you do not implement it properly uh, it can become a mental nightmare um, so in several cases, companies either fail to efficiently test the strategy um, um, once they execute it, and they didn't revisit the approach and the results they ended up. So basically, they just added complexity to the pricing processes. And uh, at the end, because they didn't validate, it came to margin erosion. So um, just imagine um, you implement the index-based uh, pricing and uh, you just uh, put it on autopilot and never challenge that again, you know, then you may leave money on the table. Also, you need to think about the processes behind it, you know, feeding the ERP systems um, and so on. If you don't have a system like Shipster, you know, to automatically uh, calculate um, the market levels and uh, send it through the system to the suppliers for approval so that it gets back into your management, you may be dealing with a lot of spreadsheets at the end and um, this is a cause for errors um, also if people are not uh, available then basically you miss out um, updating the the um, rate sheets and um, this may lead into um, yeah billing uh, issues at the end right. so, so how do you start with the index based pricing yeah, there are a couple of questions you need to ask yourself um, first. Um, really important question is, you know, which market level, you know, um, uh, shall I apply? Uh, and uh, shall I do it for the whole global business or only parts of it? You know, Sasha and, uh, at class, they um, looked at their business and said, okay, for us, the most value is to do it on Asia because uh, this is the most volatile market. Um, so that's the biggest uh, benefit. But um, if you are starting too late in the situation right now, it's a question, do I base my, um, as a baseline, uh, is it the contract uh, market? Is it the spot market? Or am I rather on the market high, market low, or market average? And here, basically, uh, market data really helps to identify uh, at what market levels um, are you buying so that you can come to agreements with your suppliers? Also, the question is, what is the right index? You know, uh, there's Seneta, you know, who have the best global coverage, of course, and uh, most of the data points. Uh, Drury, um, who have um, also uh, global coverage, um, Baltic Exchange, uh, CFI, and, and others. Mm -hmm. If you, of course, only do China, then SCFI may be sufficient for you. But if you want to run a global strategy, uh, then, of course, you need to uh, basically use uh, services of Zenetta or Drury. So the right index um, is really an important question. And 
what's the frequency to update you know is it monthly is it quarterly is it uh bi-weekly is it every two months um does this need to be agreed also if there's a one month delay in updating the rates or if it's basically done uh, precisely for every uh, month and at the end you know how long uh, are you going to run this you know is this just uh, basically an exceptional process because of the current market situation or are you going to establish this uh, basically um, uh, on the long run uh? and then it's uh, important as i've mentioned earlier that you really validate uh, if this uh, mechanism really brings you on the long run uh, the biggest benefits okay um we have some questions but we uh, we get to that later on but first uh we're going to hear from uh dear cousin from uh continental talk about uh, lane segmentation so dear cousin hi welcome hi nice uh, to be here yeah i can hear you yes uh, um yeah Let's see if uh, we have uh, the, the right uh, sound. So, can you introduce you, uh, your company, Continental, uh, briefly before you move into uh, the, the freight ocean uh, bit? Sure. Yeah. Thanks again for the invitation. I hope the uh, technique is working now after some issues in the beginning. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Continental is uh, the second largest automotive supplier in the world, actually. And uh, I think we are well known for our famous high quality tires. Um, but in the end, we also have other products. Eh? So um, we have um, two main areas. One is the one for automotive supplies, where we are also leading player in autonomous mobility, where we are looking for all kinds of spare parts in cars. Um, but then, of course, the large areas also in the tire section, um, where we also have the large FCL volume. Um, and globally, um, yeah, we have a global footprint overall. We are also originated in, in Germany, and uh, this year we will also celebrate uh, our 150 years anniversary. And meanwhile, we have around about 230,000 employees all around the world. Um, and of course, we have many different factories uh, which we have to supply uh, by global ocean freight. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully everybody can hear, uh, uh, dear Carson. But, but I don't know. Um, some some figures about uh, Continental, and then uh, we get into uh, the ocean freight bit. Um. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. As already mentioned, we have around about two hundred thirty-six thousand employees. Um, we achieved in two thousand and twenty sales of around about uh, thirty-seven point uh, seven billion euros. Uh, and we are more or less in close to 60 countries with more than 560 locations. Um, basically, as I mentioned, we have two groups. One is the automotive group focusing on the automotive supplies, being responsible for around about 40% of the supplies um, and the revenue. And we have the rubber technologies um, where we are having a huge um, business with the tires. Um, but we also have other products such as conveyor belts uh, where we have quantity tech. Um, yeah. And this year we also went, uh, and last year, through transition phase. Um, so basically we had all the powertrain division uh, focus on supplies for combustion engines, engines etc. Um, and we will completely separate that from the company. There's a spin-off going on, and that will be a separate company for the Tesco also going to the stock exchange. All right. So let's uh, talk about uh, uh, the ocean freight business. So can you explain this? Yeah, sure. I mean, in Ocean Freight, um, we have different setups, uh, but the main setup which we are focusing on here is our BCO setup, where we are tendering the Ocean Freight directly to the carriers. Um, we have around about 120,000 standard containers in that setup. Uh, and basically what we did in the, in the past is that we tendered everything with one yearly common event. You know? uh, although we already have different types of uh, routes, like more or less every shipper will have, uh, so we have large routes. Uh, and basically, we have also smaller routes, and uh, easy to distinguish um, for us is uh, that um, with the weekly space protection, or let's say the weekly volumes we have. So for us, first of all, large routes are all routes where we have more than one container per week, and then the small routes where we only have some volume of smaller uh, routes. And uh, I mean, typical ABC uh, system, the large routes are 14% of the routes in terms of number of routes. Uh, while accounting for 75% of the volume behind. Um, while talking about the smaller routes, um, they account for 86%, so it's roughly 2,000 routes if we have here at smaller routes, um, but only account for 25% of the overall volume. 
Um, yeah, and as, as we look at uh, how you did it, so um, in the past it was one common tender, even covering all volumes. Ex exactly. Yeah. So we had one uh, common tender covering all the volumes, small volumes, uh, large volumes. We wanted a huge tender event running for quite some months, um, negotiating with the carriers and then fixing fixing rates uh, for one year, um, regardless whether we are talking about a large route and a small route. And if you compare it so with the, with the uh, spot market and the content market, so um, could you explain this? So uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that was how we did it in the past. And um, however, we learned already a lot about the crisis situation which we are facing at the moment. And what we experienced then this year is, is that carriers became quite strict in terms of their space protection. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So they took our annual forecast and divided it basically by 52 um, to, yeah, let's say, fix those volumes then per week. And that is the protected volume which we will get. It means whenever we shipped uh, more than the annual volume divided by 52 per week, then we are always up to space and equipment by the carriers. And if we don't get that space and equipment, uh, we needed to go to the spot market in quite some cases. And I mean, as we see just also in this example, for, for every route, there's always a frequency. For a lot of products, there's also some seasonality behind. Um, so you frequently run into that problem. Um, and that caused also the need then for us to do quite some spot uh, tendering and spot shipment uh, to keep our plants running in the end. So, so uh, what will you do in, in the near future? Yeah, in the near future, it will be our approach to proactively um, um, tackle that topic. Means for all the areas where we basically needed to uh, then step into spot tendering, um we will go for shorter validities and we'll first of all try to fix what we are able to fix as a weekly space protection upfront also for longer validity means one year um and for the exceeding volumes we will try to do or let's say we will go for a bulk tendering means we are looking at the volumes in the specific quarter and then we are tendering that as a bulk volume to the carriers. It means, for example, here, if we have a look to the larger route, we would have then for those 500 containers, which we have here per year, we have a weekly space protection of nine containers. And then we would have a look to quarter run and say, okay, um, we expect to have then 12 containers uh, on, on top uh, based on, on our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then we tender those 12 containers additionally as a bulk volume, uh, means you know, regardless of the weekly space protection additionally, so that we can then use during quarter one 12 additional containers with a specific carrier. Um, and that will be also the same approach for, for smaller routes, uh, so that in the end it will be our approach that um, we will have one large tender for the base load, uh, yeah. plus multiple smaller tenders, and then only spot for emergency cases. Um, so we almost run out of time. Uh, sorry for that, but it's quite an interesting uh, topic. But maybe you can uh, uh, briefly talk about uh, the future and the reasoning and the requirements, and also uh, why using Shipstar. Yeah. So actually, the use of Shipstar is not even decided for us. But um, I mean, in general, I, I can very briefly go through that. Yeah? So the reasoning behind is quite clear. There are, of course, some efforts behind to run for such a, an approach. But in the end, we need to make sure that at every time of the year, we get the required volume. And at the moment, we are partially struggling with that, and we need to do a lot of spot tendering. And that's why we want to go into a proactive approach there, shorten the validities to tender the volumes um, yeah, more recently and more up to date, and make sure that with the rates we are agreeing here, we have a fair market level where we will be sure that we get the required volume then in the end. Um, such an approach, of course, requires then um, some internal and external yeah, um, preparation means for us, we need to have good data quality. We need to have a good and timely forecasting, also short decision cycles. Um, but of course, it will need also a software solution there yeah, because just um, a former Excel tendering or, or something like that will not work out if we want to do a quarterly or even more frequent tendering. And therefore, we need definitely software solutions like also ShipStars offering. Okay. Um, so we, uh, what, uh, like I said, we also run out of time. So uh, thank you, uh, dear Carsten, for your explanation. Great to see that you have uh, uh, managed to cut down uh, uh, the spot buying part. Um, uh, Oliver, to, to wrap in your, up in your direction, could you briefly comment on what you are doing as Shipstar, and then we will, uh, well, we move over to uh, the Q and A probably in the lounge. 
Okay, good. Yeah, tomorrow we're actually launching a new product uh, called Chipster Scan. And uh, this is basically kind of unique because we are combining um, the rate management with uh, market intelligence. Uh, you see it on the screen. So we scan uh, in real time the market and check uh, uh, basically your budget against uh, saving potentials or, or cost impact. So um, basically that helps you for fast uh, budgeting or instant market monitoring, but also of course for a tendering exercise. So basically, you know, before you tender already what expect in terms of uh, savings or cost impact, and you can use basically the data um, to um, also negotiate basically um, with your suppliers after the first round um, to uh, reach um, um, a market level. Okay, uh, so uh, can you explain uh, how you uh, identify the lanes and the, the, the savings? Yeah, basically um, what we uh, do is um, um, a daily uh, monitoring um, of the lanes um, and the system automatically um, consolidates uh, those lanes for tendering. So um, um, you see here on the animation also the dashboard after the analysis, we basically show you uh, what the state um, of your business is, you know, uh, what is the um, freight spend, what's the business impact, um, what are the regions or lanes with the best opportunities. And um, also later on, uh, as you know it from the stock exchange market and recommendation, if you rather should tender, hold or um, extend your rates. Okay. Um, so, so what is the level of automation which you can achieve? Yeah, the level uh, of automation is first of all, you don't need to um, basically select the lanes for tendering anymore. So the system is doing it uh, completely uh, autonomously. And the second thing, again, um, you, uh, in the past, you needed to basically create a tender event. And the system is basically creating a tender event on your behalf. And you just need to click on the start button. And then it's uh, basically re released to the market. So that's basically the first uh, functionality of a series um, of features um, um, of our auto procure um, um, concept to basically um, allow shipper to work smarter and uh, more efficiently with our procurement solutions. So you are in control? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not every shipper likes uh, the idea of autonomous procurement. You know, it's always a matter of trust. So the first one you maybe do manually, then you increase the level of auto automation once you gain more trust. And uh, once you see basically that it runs really like a Swiss uh, clock, then uh, you uh, further increase to a step uh, towards autonomous procurement. And uh, with our Shipster Scan controller, you can individually uh, basically set uh, saving levels uh, and you can decide what level of um, procurement automation you like to use. All right. Uh, thank you for explanation. So actually, yeah, we, we, we uh, should, should plan for a QA and a at this moment, but uh, actually we are already uh, over time. So uh, my suggestion would be, I, I see some, some interesting question and uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, ask this question uh, directly in the lounge. And I will make sure that this question will also be answered afterwards if they are not answered in the lounge. So, uh, you know, I would uh, say, you know, after this, uh, in a minute, um, um, Oliver, dear Karsten, Sasha and myself will go into the lounge. We'll be uh, seating uh, at the table one. So please join us over there uh, and you can uh, ask your questions. So I saw uh, some questions. So uh, my apology for some, some uh, sound issues with uh, uh, dear Karsten from Continental. But uh, you know, we are still here to answer your question. So, and there's more uh, uh, online. You will have the availability to book a demo of Shipstar. Um, so um, with this, I would like to wrap up and I would like to thank uh, Oliver, Sasha, the dear uh, Karsten for uh, joining us. So Oliver, thank you. All right, thanks uh, Martin, Sasha and uh, Dirk, it was a great session. So Sasha, also thank you. And yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for hearing. Okay, and dear Karsten, right. thank you. Thank you too. Uh, and everybody listening, so we have a great turn up and uh, please join us uh, in the lounge if you have questions. Uh, we are here in the next, uh, what should I say, 26 uh, minutes. So thank you for joining and uh, maybe I see you in a lounge or otherwise I will see you next week uh, on Webinar Windsor at four o'clock CET.
Thank you, and uh, hopefully to see you uh, in the lounge.